Welcome to tonight's Avid Bookshop author event. My name is Rachel and we're here in Athens, Georgia, and we're so happy to virtually host two gifted poets tonight on our virtual platform. We want to extend our greatest thanks to all of you who've continually shown up and supported small locally businesses, uh, particularly authors who've had publication dates during the global pandemic. It's We've done a handful of virtual events and the poetry ones are my favorite. So I think y'all are in for a treat tonight. Um, on that note, I'll hand the night over to Jennifer and Jenny. We might have time for a Q&A, no promises. So you can post questions in the chat and we'll see if we can get to them. So take it away, y'all. Thanks so much, Rachel and Avid Bookshop for having us tonight. I'm really excited to be in conversation um, with Jenny about her book, Dear Outsiders. I just like to hold it up um, first so you can kind of see how how wonderful the, the art object of this collection is. Um, we're gonna do a different format tonight rather than um, just you know a standard reading. Um, this will be kind of a conversation braided with um, excerpts and reading. So tonight I think we'll open up by having um, Jenny read one poem from um, Dear Outsiders and I'll read a response poem and then I'll pose a question and we'll move forward with um, you know, just kind of hearing from Jenny about her thought process in writing this really exquisite, um, very unique work, um, and then hearing some pieces and kind of going back and forth. And then we'll close with another um, poem pair from the two of us. So um, Jenny, would you like to read um, Topography to open? This is the first poem in the book. Topographies. An egret with a fish speared on his beak. Not your hands twisting out the wet from a shirt. Steam from a shower that belongs to our mother. Not a fire scrubbing us all. A branch leaning too hard on a fence. Not a mail carrier reaching for letters we write our parents. Balancing on one leg, our hands over our heads at the end of the water. Not a flag in our neighbor's yard. Our mother's body, not our mother's body. Our father's body, not our father's body. A grief bleeding at our shores. A landscape breaking. Mm, beautiful, thank you. Um... When I thought about that opening poem, um, this one came to mind. This is from um, How to Live on Bread and Music, and the poem, I have not read this one in a while, but uh, I really wanted to be invited after hearing topographies. This is The Earth Repeats and We Follow. And it's kind of a contrapuntal, like told in two voices, and um, you know, your book is so very much told in two voices. So, The Earth Repeats and We Follow. The earth repeats itself, so tiny in our houses, a forest fills with questions. One who never leaves cannot return, to walk with the urgency of bees. When I say she, I mean mother, looking for a new home, a language of silences, over moss creeks, alyssum. If words do not fall, they are buried, Trees are governed by space and light. A body wraps in maps. Growth is a fracturing. I become what I cannot say. See the cypress reclined on the hill. The earth repeats and we follow. Light hardens into leaves. So beautiful. Thank you. So I'm going to begin um, by asking you a question, but before I do, I just wanted to invite like a space if you wanted to um, talk a little bit about the book, um, you know, just for, for the audience tonight. And if you kind of want that to be like revealed through the conversation, that's okay too. But I just wanted to give you the opportunity to, to you know, frame it a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, so the book is told from two siblings perspective. Um, 
they live in a tourist beach town with their parents. And um, then um, something happens to their parents. Um, and then in the second half of the book, um, they move to land um, and, and they really are, are reliant on each other. So I, I guess that's kind of <laughs> it in a nutshell. Yeah, I think that helps helps us get a, get a foothold a little bit. So I wanted to know if you could tell us about the experience of writing from the unusual perspective of the like interior we or the plural first person we as one of your blurbers phrased. Um, we have this pair of siblings who are so very much a part of each other. And I can't help thinking about the striking cover art. I just love holding this book up where the two like are visually eclipsing into each other in like that classic secret telling gesture. And that interlocking we-ness is such an inventive speaker. Uh, I wondered like how you settled on letting that we be the one voice and like who did you feel they were addressing? Um, it often felt like they were telling themselves like almost to know that they had voices and I was sort of overhearing it as the reader. And I guess I just wondered in like terms of generation of the of the collection, did you hear them talking to you? Did you feel you were listening to them? Um, you know, just as the writer, what did they show you in that process? Yeah, that's, thank you, Jennifer. So many good questions. Um, I think that I liked having a collective narrator because I felt like it gave the poems more weight um, I also think that it gives them a sense of urgency, like they're having to get this out and, you know, um, I also think, and I think this is tricky, I think it gives the book more mystery because maybe the reader is trying to figure out who the we is and maybe the we shifts throughout the book. Um, but I, I think that that, that's a gamble you know, because I think that um, some readers may not, that may turn them off, you know, the, the mystery may um, be a barrier. So it's my hope that it's not. Um, I think that in places as far as who they're addressing, I think that they're addressing themselves. I think that in places they're addressing the tourists and the visitors. But I also think that they're addressing their parents. Okay. Um, I also think that they're addressing themselves. You know, I felt like I was listening to them when I was writing it. And I felt like I really had to let go and let this strange voice and this strange language that hasn't really come to me in other books kind of come through. And a lot of that is um, really letting go. And that's very difficult for me to do. It was just a, it was a real surrender um, to I what these poems feel that wanted surrender. to be. I can feel that surrender as a reader because I really trust the voice. And I think with that intimate we space, like when I'm reading a book with an I, I try on the I. Is it me? Can I be the I for a minute? And because the we was so intimate, sometimes I tried on the we too, like just as a reader and sort of slipped myself into their, their you know, kind of that collective voice. Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, I've written essays with you you do this, you, you know, and it's, it's kind of that same thing. You're putting the reader in those shoes. So I think that at times maybe it can feel alienating maybe for the reader. And I think at times maybe it does bring them in. And I, and I kind of want that experience, both of those experiences, you know, right to both orient and disorient at the same time. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Well, let's hear a few, a few poems so we can hear that, that we. Okay. Okay. Um, Docs. Our father balanced rocks in a past life. He lived by a river he doesn't remember. And he tells us that this is why he came from the land and the mountains this life. He talks about tectonic plates, how mountains were formed, 
describes floating continents and what will happen when all the water in the world has disappeared. We saw a stack of pink roses on the beach once. It was early winter and they were dozens. They belonged to us. Everything did in the cold. Not even the gulls wanted them. Without the water, we'd be without our mother. Without our father, we would lose the world under our knees. When you love the beach, you love it no matter what. Maybe one more? Yeah. One more origin story. She said the gulf spat her out and yes, we believed. Her fingers never, never wrinkled from water, a camorant. Our mother swam past markers, past chartered boats, and never turned around for a crowd of applause. No guard radioed in her bright back. What else can we tell you, but she's an orphan from an atmosphere we don't know. She saw the crawler crusher make this place. We take her fin, paddle out. Can we hear one more before I ask another question? <laughs> okay, I'm just loving this. <laughs> um, tragedy lesson. Describe drown. We don't say it too loud when it happens. It's not for the hotel people, people who pay for symmetrical shells. They walk out so far that they can't tell which place is theirs on the way back. We're sure there's nothing that could keep them away anyway not the burns, not even if we told all the jellies to wait outside their do not disturb doors. We know them by the color of their towels. Orange is the fanciest resort. Blue is the motel without water views. They line their balconies with them, flags to countries they'll never belong to. The body is rescued and buried because it didn't swim at 45 degrees to shore. There aren't long talks over dinners. We're so sorry, and that's enough. Hmm. Oh, that's great, Jenny. Thank you. One thing that um, that we voice accomplishes is the sense that their the siblings are just innately connected to their topography, and when they speak, I really hear the echo of the place itself speaking so much from the poems you just read. Uh, in particular. Um, somehow the place is like nested in that bonded we. Um, and so if the siblings were to be orphaned, does the role of place become surrogate? Um, what kinds of connections to place did you want to explore through them? And um, maybe like, where did that inquiry begin for you? I love that, Jennifer, thank you. Um, I think that, if the siblings were, um, I'm sorry, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I think that place becomes that, but I also think that it, it becomes a reminder. So the water does, it represents the parents and because the parents are gone, they have to find somewhere else, right? It's an avoidance of the parents' deaths. It's not accepting it. Do you know what I mean? Um, I think that I was thinking a lot about nature versus nurture. Um, what happens when the, the people who live in the town, right? Like what happens when the siblings then become the outsiders because they move to a different environment um, in an environment where that does not remind them of their parents at all. Their parents are scrubbed from that. They've never had a life there, right? Um, and how that, that aids or doesn't aid in, in recovering, right, from their deaths. Yeah, yeah, then there becomes this sort of void of them, which can be like a security thing, but also can be, you know, just the abyss also, right, without that thread of connection. Yeah, and I think that like, if, if you don't have those reminders, there becomes even more um, of, of a need to remember, right? I have to keep, you know, like they keep telling themselves, you know, there's a lot of lists in there and things like that, right? As, as a way to document and remember, like 
our mother wanted us to write down our clothing. So we're going to do that in case we were abducted. Um, and so it's just this repetition, um, I think, to to remember, you know, yeah. I think they, they, it's right. They don't want to remember. But at the same time, if they don't remember, then their parents really slip away. Yeah. Oh, that 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 makes sense. And, and to that kind of scavenging after after place and scavenging after memory at the same time. There's such like really intense, like vital energy behind those those actions. I think it makes us sort of feel a little, um, I don't ask ourselves those questions, like in what ways do we scavenge after memories um, as much as we do or don't feel connected to these two. Like, you know, I did sort of feel those questions were inviting uh, my own thoughts as well as reader. Yeah, let's hear a few more poems. I'm gonna move toward the second part, you know, um, when, when they move to um, land. Um, I will, there's a couple of curse words in this one, but um, I'll just, I won't say them. Um, dear outsiders, young boys here cut bad words and bad pictures into fall cover crops. Words like F and S and damn. Pictures like penises and testicles. The fact that we can't read them since we're on the land means that they aren't meant for us, the wayward marcher, marchers. Their mothers and fathers look at the butchering they've done and they're kept from fun and cars and formals that we won't go to either. And we're writing to say that you shouldn't be so loud when you walk if you wanna blend in. Their pool lifeguards are soft and their sad whistles wilt on their necks when they sigh into them. If you wanna say you were born here, lower your knees. Mm. Oh. Right. Um, let's do a few more before the next question, too, because it's so nice to hear these, I think, in like groups of three, maybe three and four. Okay. Yeah, it's just really wonderful. The sounds in that one especially are just still fantastic. Thank you. Let's see. Throw ring. Orange is the vest for hunting, the ring for saving at sea. Our mother's hands are gone from where they held applause. Her orange lips bringing a note in her throat. Her fingernails are circus peanuts. Her hands, sun rays we send ourselves in. We line the windowsills with tangerines. Her mouth, a warning that she would be found if she wanted to be saved. Mm. Here in the summer, we mistake the neighbor children for cats. Their mules come out in the afternoon when they run into rusted sprinklers, brave and clumsy. Their bodies aren't deliberate in the way ours are when we look for juniper in between their chairs that are sunny and too small for anyone but dolls. We hear their babies crying through the house walls. We put out milk before we understand what we aren't feeding. Mm. There are rivers of milk between their ribs. Oh, Jenny. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I love the way in the second half too, the um, small moments come in that show like just that really deep stewardship over their own mothering in the absence of. Um, you just do a beautiful job of just slipping these lyric moments in that um, allow us to kind of really fall into the almost dreamscapes of this of this collective voice. I'm not quite sure how you do it, but you do do it. <laughs> and um, I think in the poems you just read, there's a little bit of that like, undercurrent of divination 
right? And I could um, find that in, in spots throughout the book, like with early poems like Fortune Fish and When We, when we Are So Young. Um, the siblings seem to have this strong and really peculiar sense of both like their freedoms, but also their limitations. Like they seem to understand their parameters um, in a way that, I know it's kind of remarkable and sort of peculiar at the same time, and I'm very like interested in it. So we have lines like, water isn't easy to read. We never watch after our parents. We aren't allowed to assign them lives they can't live. We don't pull the thread, the net, the warning into our chests. Today isn't the day we die. And so I wonder like, is this a faded world? Um, the themes of fortune and clairvoyance, sort of seeing beyond seeing and this deep intuition um, have been prominent in previous collections of yours. So I wonder, like, how is divination working in this collection? And do you feel that that does that energy feel like it's just connected to poetry for you at large? I love this, too. I, you know, I think that when I think about, when I, when I think about, okay, so <laughs> I think that one way of surrendering or one way of also making sense of things is to surrender. So, you know, there's this piece in thinking that everything's predetermined, right? There's also an anxiety throughout the collections, especially the first section of what's gonna happen, what is the future? Can we tell the future? And if we can tell the future, then we can um, sidestep, we can avoid any kind of trauma or loss. And, and yeah, I, I definitely think that that was really prominent in Malak, definitely. But I think that there's a sort of comfort in ironically also on the flip side of believing that things are predetermined then you don't have control then you have to every no matter how hard you don't want your parents you know they don't want their parents to pass away it's inevitable um and so i think that they have an anxiety of when will it happen it's it's not a matter of when will it happen to them it's that their parents are their gods you know and um and all that they know and I think that there is, I hope that it comes through that even in that first section, even though they live in that, that beach town, that even amongst their community, they are still also kind of their own little insular, you know, like their own little community. And, and maybe it's like codependency, maybe it's not healthy, but I don't think it is because I'm, I kind of, feel that way about my family. Um, but there's just a sense of safety there, you know, between the siblings and their parents. And I think that that makes it even more difficult and, and unbearable when they lose them, because it's not just them losing where they grew up and what's familiar. It's also them losing their safety. Yeah. And it's interesting because through through their kind of very interior story, like we can start to engage with like questions of like memory, what are we connected to? How are we safe? How do we avoid trauma? How do we embrace trauma? Do we surrender? And I don't think you're, you know, outrightly asking those questions, but we follow the progression and we ask ourselves these questions. Um, it's just this really beautiful way that I think any reader is gonna sort of dialogue um into what the the currents that you've set up you know by these really vital um tensions that are pulling them and they're trying to make sense of and i did feel like they were almost the only people on the earth although you know you've located them in the beach towns and they know the tourists and how they behave and they're very good studiers and observers of that world so it, it has to be there obviously but i almost do feel like it's they're the only ones you know the the parents and them as i'm reading it you do such a good job of distilling the focus to to that interior sense of of family thank you and i think that there's a sense coming through hopefully of like this hyper vigilance right yeah if you have people in your environment tourists all the time 
you're trying to assess if there's danger, who, who are these people? This is my space, right? As much as space can belong to someone. And so I think that that, that hypervigilance may serve them when they come into that second part where they are in you know, unfamiliar territory. And so they're, they're now, they're still, it doesn't matter if they're at their home or they're somewhere else they've been displaced, they're still trying to, to orient themselves, you know? I think another question that that um, is elicited from the work is like um, they are of this place um, and the people that come and visit are not of this place. Therefore, those people are not of them. You know, there's a disconnect there. And so I think just another question of um, thinking about what are we so rooted to that we are so knitly of like through and through like so believably so comes through um very strongly as well in terms of place and i thought i would read one poem just to sort of dialogue in with the ones that you've read so far um the girl or the siblings also have um this tremendous sense of their own bodies moving through these environments. I mean, there's very much that somatic kind of in the body feel in the book. And, and I love that. And so this is a poem that I think maybe speaks to that, but also of like the larger energies of the world and how we respond to them. Wind under the skin. House full of crickets. Moon slung low in the birches. Good night, the clock with its one good eye. Do not keep watch over the tossing bed, the uncorked wine. A wind large as a country roils up the coast. We will wake to hacked cedars in silence. The locked door buckles. Crickets scatter the floor like dropped coins. How much of the body is sail? How much anchor? I love that. And I wondered maybe now if we could hear um, some pieces that, that take us into that second environment, um, into this sort of forest environment more. There's a gap in the land. Cows line the rim of a pond and they will survive the heat. We don't sleep under dead trees. We treat emergency injuries as soon as we see them. There's a gap in the land and it's where we wanna hide. We wanna cover this whole town up with their cow patties and cow tipping and toilet paper rolling. They leave markers where people die if it happened on a road. We want our parents to arrive breathing in their mouths saying, we just wanted to know you would be okay without us. Mm. The start of the thread. We were raised up by our mother singing. She took the lead, the start of the thread in every song and we let her. Her hands, open like she carried invisible plates to feed everyone. We were raised up by our father's paintings, drawing on the walls, turpentine hugging the windows and refused to leave. We don't push our mouths into singing since we lost her. And when we found a tube of paint someone left behind, we squeezed it all out onto the sidewalk and let the sun eat it right up. Mm. It's so funny because when I've been reading these, they're much, the second section of the book is much more difficult. <laughs> Even though it's not autobiographical, I feel so tied to them that it's more difficult for me to read the, the poems in the second, second section. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> levels of force. All the lamps we've hugged, I'm sorry, all the lamps we've had, we've hugged too hard. At night, the shadow is our mother's waist and hips and skirt. The world will take back the water 
and wind if we can get our rooms just right. One of us stays in the house while the other pours water outside against the ribs of the house with drenched shoes that belong to our mother. The one in the house says louder, louder, make it like we were born here. And then we rake through our braids and our armpits for salt and sand and come up empty. Yeah. I think the connection, the way that you illuminate grief being so in the body and scavenging for signs and looking for looking, looking, um, it becomes a really deep and I can see why it would be more challenging to read those voices. There's something very raw and really authentic moving through grief. It's not about grief, but it's it's like literally moving through it and that voice um, that you you draw through there. Um, it just feels so close to it. It's almost unbearable, you know, but and yet um, there's something so like honest and authentic about the how you how you carry them through that space that I feel like I'm able to access that emotion like via them more so than I can um, about a poem that I kind of know is going to be an on grief type poem, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that, you know, like if we get our beds just right and if we do this, you know, there's this way of, um, I don't know, making sense, trying to make sense of something that's, you know, um, that, that can't make sense, you know? Um, I think that it's, it's, if we can make sense of it, then we can avoid it. You know, I've done this in my life with any trauma I've endured, tried to think through it instead of feel it and yeah. accept it and stay grounded. It's much easier for me to to try and um, make sense of it or rationalize or, right? Or that magical thinking, right? Yeah. yeah. If I, can I realign my narrative to make it all fit somehow? So I think as the reader, you're watching them doing that, but you know that they can't. And so you have that, almost that tension within yourself of, of watching them go through that process. and starting to carry the the weight of knowing that it's not going to be possible and then you can feel how maybe you've done that yourself as well you know yeah let's do um another question because i think i have a question that sort of speaks to this a little bit um let's see okay um this one I think is a good one to ask. There's so many fascinating questions the book takes up or sort of themes, like I've been saying, um, with an imagination that just wants to open as many little secret doors as possible. Um, but I keep coming back to the way that origins and survival become scavenged after. And I think of the final lines of the book, um, this is where we were born, this is where we became orphans, where we stayed on top of the water, this is where we say no more. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how um, you approach the themes of survival and origins, and maybe how did you know when the siblings were had their final say when they weren't talking to you any longer? Ah, that's good. <laughs> I think that I think toward the end I started realizing that I was the orphans, that I was the, you know, they had finally, it, it, I felt like I was them, right, in the beginning when I was writing it. You know, I should say that, that I wrote this in the span of like five days, the entire manuscript, right, and so um, I was at my first residency, and um, I, they had put me in <laughs> a cabin, that none of the other residents, like they were all far away from me. So I was just in like this even more isolated than everyone else. Um, so they were on the main campus. And, and so I just felt very alone. And when I went there, I, I knew that I was an INFJ, right? So Myers-Briggs introvert. <laughs> so I thought this is going to be fine. Like I'll, I'll love this. I love being alone. And, and it was just, it, we, there was a phone in the, um, in, in the cabin that would not dial out. So someone could only dial in. 
and then there was no internet and it was just it it was just too much you know and so i had come there with a different manuscript and i hung them all up in the cabin all the poems and i looked at them and i was like this is not i don't want to write this book wow. and and so um the person who would call my cabin was my dad <laughs> really early in the morning because we both get up super early and I was like, I just don't know what to write. And he said, well, I think you should maybe just write what you're afraid of. And so then these, these siblings started coming up. And um, what's a little funny, I guess, is that after, after I came back, I was talking to a fellow writer in Atlanta and he said, ask me the name of that, that house, that cabin, because they all have names. And, I told him and he was like, oh, I know multiple people. He said, I stayed in that one and everyone just kind of lost their minds in that cabin. You know, that there's something about it. <laughs> like, that makes sense. Wow, so but, it, but this was there for you. Right. That's amazing. That's amazing. Right. Wow. Right. So I think that like, also, I know this is an answer to the question, but when we think about like environment, right? Yes. Like when you place yourself in somewhere that is so, unfamiliar to you yeah. and you feel so cut off like I I very much was grasping toward origin grasping toward my parents and like where I came from because that that scenery and that setting was was so um unknown to me you know and so everything was kind of scary you know I they gave me um they gave all the residents when you first got there a bear bell um that you could wear because bears I guess are can't see really well so they were like so if you want to go go here's hiking bear bell. Anything, we're, yeah here's a bear <laughs> bell and it was like what is a bear gonna come like kill me in the middle of the night like so I I had no idea um you know it was, it was just very different and so I I actually ended up um because I I felt like I was going out of my mind I joined a gym at the bottom of the mountain where there was service and I would just go in there and just like listen to people talk like I just needed <laughs> to be around like, you know, and I like listen to a bunch of podcasts in the cabin because I just felt so lonely, you know. Wow. Wow. So um, that's such a particular origin story of your book. You know, first of all, that you wrote it over such a deeply concentrated amount of time and under these circumstances that were really disquieting, discomforting, um, and sort of disorienting in and of themselves. And then you kind of like almost created a, a persona or, or a way to kind of channel others to, to access the emotions that came up. Yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. Well, in a way of coping. <laughs> in a way of coping. Think, sure. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I, think, I think that really when I think about the siblings, I think that they're talking to me, you know, like they're comforting me um, or, and I'm comforting myself, you know, I'm the siblings, I'm, you know, um, so, so yeah. And when so did that, you hear them like not talking to you anymore? When did you know that they had sort of said their piece, you know, and you had listened? I think- Or maybe that so wasn't a clear moment, you know? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that once the poems were done, I didn't hear them anymore, but then it was difficult because the voice was so strong yeah. and it really did feel like I was, um, it was being transmitted to me. It was really, really, really difficult to get back into that. Back in, yeah. yeah. How do you I mean, pour like, yourself back in, right? Yeah, I mean, and so I took myself on field trips. Like I drove back to the residency, even though I didn't have- said, did you put the bear bell back on? <laughs> <laughs> I had the bear bell, yeah. So, I, you know, I went back to to where the residency was. I drove on, on that mountain um, or ridge. Uh, I went to, um, I didn't go to the gym, but there was, you know, like a swap meet, you know, yeah, and that, yeah. that ends up in there. Um, and so then I, I infused that in, into the, to the poems, trying to get back into um, that mindset in the first section, you know, a lot of trips to beaches, a lot of talking to my mom because she grew up in, in a tourist beach town and, um, and, and kind of getting details from her. 
too. Okay. Okay. Wow, that's fascinating. I don't think we've, we've shared that before. Um, <laughs> can you read some more poems for us? And it, you know, from anywhere in the book, if you're <laughs> wherever you feel pulled. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Fortune fish. We win a red cellophane fish, his body like antique onion skin. The paper envelope he's kept in must be old as our parents. The envelope tells us to hold him in one palm and be very still. You are so excited. The Ferris wheel's light catches on his tail. We take him out to the water, let him swell with the bigger fish. We pick up two shells and hold them over both our ears. The waves slap our house inside our heads. This is where we were born, we say to the fish camp. Everyone on the boardwalk claps when the scenes get shuffled. The sun goes down and the fireworks cruise comes out from behind the curtain. Mm. Um, okay. Anchor bend. When we wanna visit the starfish, we swim out. We aren't allowed when they're giving tours to hotel people. We know starfish have eyes, even if we can't see them on their faces, just like we know the vanishing island is real, even though sometimes it disappears, the tides covering it up, lost and found. We feel what the other feels, and if one of us swims too fast, the other's legs hurt and we both have to take a break. Sometimes we think one of us will dissolve. Mm. Oh, that twinned heart. <laughs> it's impossible to hear that poem without feeling tethered to even just the idea of an other. You know, I think we always court this idea of an other. Um, whether it's an other aspect of ourselves or just your imaginary sort of companion, whatever that that anima animus energy is. Um, and so I hear those poems, um, that one especially about the, the eyes and the following each other and the legs hurt and we stop and um, that sense of being tethered it just feels like such a body feeling like right in the you know core here. Oh, that's that's beautiful, Jenny. Show that it's, so well. It's, it's so funny that you know how you talk about the poems being so somatic and and I guess grounded or you know like in a lot of feelings in the body because um, that's how I definitely know they're not my poems. Or <laughs> I didn't write them because I never stay in my body. You know, I'm always always floating out. So so yeah. So I think that maybe that's also why it's difficult to read sometimes some of the poems. Yeah. yeah. Let's hear a few more and I'd like to ask you one more question. Okay. Locals. People who aren't us think that the ocean is all blue, mm. but there are lines if you look hard. Water isn't easy to read. We say dolphins can stay underwater 20 minutes tops. We tell them that we bury our dead boats and container ships. We say the waves are clapping for you. We say there are reasons why we don't build our houses taller than our trees. We don't tell them that the town is taking the toll away. We only warn the small children about going out higher than their waists. We point out what they should take pictures of even though it's nothing. Mm. We go past the buoys, warnings floating, and the lifeguards don't say a thing. We aren't worth the trouble. We're a reflection swimming backwards. We're crabs breaking the pot. And a poem like that too, and, and the other one ending with that dissolve, they're so there, but yet they're so almost slipping into not being there at the same time. There's this beautiful, uncanny way that their presence and their absence are just almost like 
folded into each other. Maybe that's, you know, foreshadowing of what happens to the parents. But I mean, they almost feel like two fortune fish kind of, you know, sliding around each other, appearing and disappearing before like the eye via these little narratives. Um, it's really magical. <laughs> So um, I have one last question here, um, and I guess it's more about the energies in the book. Um, you know, narrative is certainly present in the book um, as there are linked prose poems that kind of carry us through a sequence, um, but there's so much narrative restraint and lyric energy um, here, which I love so much. Um, the element of story is like mythical and often sort of a dreamlike one where the readers never grounded too long before disorienting again. Um, so the sequences just seem like they're born out of of lyric energy and unsettling syntax, sort of swaying tones, strange submersions, shifting memory. And I wonder how did you work with or against perhaps, um, sort of knowing that there was a narrative current that would run through the linked work, but um, holding on to, I guess, the guiding lyric energy of the book. I think that when my dad told me to write about what I was afraid of, I knew that it would, I knew what the end goal was. I knew that I was afraid of my parents um, passing away. And so I wanted to write toward that, but I wasn't sure, you know, it made sense to show how close and linked they were to their parents and then to show the aftermath of what it would, what it would be like to lose them. Um, one of the the questions that you know when I was younger I would ask people as a way of trying to pin them down as a way of of trying to decipher who they were and if they were safe and I say younger I mean like my 20s so <laughs> sure, I sure. would ask I would ask people if they liked the water or the mountains better mm -hmm. and my mom loves the water and my dad loves the mountains. And so it was my shortcut of trying to figure, you know, like figure out who they were, um, which is kind of ridiculous, but I, you know, I think it was born from anxiety. And so I've always kind of carried that with me that like, what is it like for my mom to be in a place where there's not water and my dad to be where there's mountains? And what is it like for me to be a water person and not be around <laughs> any kind of water? And so I wanted that, those kind of ways of looking at the world maybe, or how, what we need from environment or how environment like um, feeds us maybe. I wanted that to be there. And so I just think of my mom as water and I think of my dad as land and mountains. And so if I'm losing them, um, you know, imagining losing them. I imagine those, those two environments, um, you know, chrono, I, I think that like Malak starts at the end and then goes, you know, reverses. And when I think about prose in general, I like when the timeline is not chronological or linear. I like when it kind of jumps around a lot. So that was a real challenge for me in this because I really resist that. But I think that because everything else in the book is so hazy and blurred that there had to be something that was um, grounding. And I thought like- to know that we're moving through, t through time and space, however, right. Uh, un yeah. Right, so that had to be like the one thing, like, it, okay, we don't have names for the siblings. We don't have genders for the siblings. We don't have names for the parents. We don't have names for towns or anything, right? So like there has to be something that that can pull the reader through the collection, you yeah. know? Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, I have a closing poem, and then I wondered if maybe you had a closing poem to read as a as a response. And then we might just have a couple of minutes if we have um, other questions. I know I've asked quite a few today, but maybe our, our you know our audience also has questions, and you could put those in the chat um, and give Jenny an opportunity to um, to weigh in on your questions as well as mine. 
Um, so this one's from Fox Logic Fire Read, and you know, talking about these two different environments. Um, this is a poem that tries to sort of live in the forest and the ocean at the same time. <laughs> So I thought it would be a good one to, to read to close. This is How Many Leaves and Boats Gather Together. Buoy the blue night, small boats lifting beyond the layers of tremble and tree. We are the watchers of the world, the note takers, the lonely captains sailing over the good earth. Meanwhile, the birds fly west. If they had a religion, it would be the agreement of flight. And fish swim in silver wheels through a horizon of slow blooming sound. Leave the moonlight to itself, what little may be answered. Let night whisper into the hull of your ear the other language. Dark wildwood that we ride silently into the harbor alone and no one sees arrival or departure, but that it matters to be so briefly carried to so close a place as home on such a thin and flickering sea. I feel like I wrote well, that poem before you wrote this book in response to your book. I really understand the poem now that, that I, I understand your book. I understand my poem now. <laughs> Do you have a response poem from Dear Outsiders? Well, I don't, I don't, know, how I, I don't know how I follow that. Um, you do, you do. <laughs> I'll, I'll read the, the, last, the last poem in the book. Perfect, perfect. Send a revival. Mm. We walk into open woods at night, ready for the palm to finally shut our crying up. We're looking for a bear who can't see us and can't hear us now. If we were home, we would swim noiseless out past the warnings. We'd say, here's the rift that sweeps our bodies under and into our chest. This is where we were born. This is where we became orphans, where we stayed on top of the water. This is where we say no more. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. Thank Fantastic. you, Jennifer. Fantastic. <laughs> Thanks, both of you, so much. We have copies of both of your books that we could pop in the mail. We can mail them anywhere in the United States, and they're gorgeous. Thank you so much, everyone. This is so special. Uh, poetry is pretty important in times like these. And I think it's a respite to, for a lot of us. Thank, Thank you so much, Avid Bookshop, for hosting and, and creating this event for us. Yay. Support, support your small bookstores. Like yes, wherever so you are, yeah. wherever you are. Thanks, y'all. Have a good night. Bye. <laughs>